Hello and welcome to this episode of the Curiosity Key podcast where I'm joined with Matt Davies. Um, welcome Matt, thank you so much for joining me here. Hi Charlie, how's it going? It's awesome. So we're going to have a lot of fun today because we're going to be talking about all things branding. Uh, it's a bit different, this podcast, to my norm because we're not going to focus on the technology today, but we are going to talk about how you can effectively brand your company, your product, and even yourself and the members of your team. So we're going to talk a lot about um, the different ways that you can brand and also how you can inject story into what it is that you're doing to captivate more of your audience. Um, I think from my point of view, there's a, a big myth in the B2B space where, you know, B2B marketing is really boring. And actually, that was where I met Matt for the first time. I think it was a, at a B2B marketing event where we were talking about the fact that B2B marketing isn't boring after all. Um, so to kick off this podcast, Matt, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? And um, yeah. Sure. Well, thanks, obviously, for having me on, uh, Charlie. I'm a big fan. And I think uh, the work that you do is, is, is super exciting and for the tech space. And so it's wonderful to be part of, of the movement, if we can call it that, that you're, uh, that you're, you're involved in. Um, so what do you want to know? A little bit about my background. I, you know, I suppose um, just some kind of key highlights from me. I, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an old designer, graphic design, grew up in London, was really passionate about design from an early age loved uh, the kind of the concept of purpose being in my work um, as opposed to kind of which which is kind of the, the core of design it's about what are we doing this for who are we doing it for why should they care what response do we want to evoke um, so purpose is a key kind of thing that really resound you know kind of responds to my personality I love it um, and that's opposed to art which I kind of define as very kind of fluffy and very self-expressive so with design, you've got to try and take yourself out of it. You've got to think about your client, what they're trying to achieve. So I grew up in London in design, learned um, on the job. I didn't go to university, um, worked for a number of agencies in London, um, moved up to Nottingham to get married, um, still married. Uh, that was some time ago. Worked for some agencies in, in Nottingham and then um, started my own creative agency, um, working on like small websites, uh, graphic design work. Um, and ran that for about nine years. And during that time, I, I realized design um, kind of was becoming commoditized and, um, and it wasn't being taken seriously. And I think the reason for that was because it wasn't strategic enough in, in how it was being perceived. And so we'll touch on some of the things that I kind of worked on from my own knowledge base, uh, particularly around brand and marketing, which enabled us to to become a little bit more strategic, a bit more useful than rather than just kind of like a veneer at the end that's kind of uh, shined and polished up from a, a, a kind of a, a sales perspective, you know, to help businesses really get to the core of the customer, what the customer needs and why it is that, that they should come to us for our product or service. Um, then sold that business, moved on, worked for the business I sold it to on their board as their creative director for nearly a couple of years. And then I was headhunted by Capital One. So, um, you know, a, um, a big fin fintech, American-based uh, credit card company um, over here in the UK, um, headquarters in Nottingham and London. So I kind of was up and down running a, uh, quite a big team there. Um, and then back end of last year, I decided to go alone um, and, uh, and branch out as a, as a consultant. So I will, I'll pause there because there's obviously tons of stuff in that, in, in <laughs> yeah. that very l sort of garbled response. But... Um, I guess the thing to note is that, that I'm very heavily now based in the, the brand strategy space. And ultimately, I help businesses stand out and be more meaningful, not just from a design perspective, but right the way through from HR, product innovation, um, and leadership. All of those kind of key areas I, I help uh, businesses with. Brilliant. I love it. And that's exactly um, why I wanted to get you on this podcast, because a lot of what I do is that you know, some people think, oh, you're just into marketing or you're just into sales or whatever. Whereas I'm trying to kind of bring everything together because you can't look at marketing in isolation. You can't look at sales in isolation. You can't look at customer service in isolation and you can't look at a leadership team on its own. You have to bring everything together. And um, exactly what you said about purpose, because a lot of our listeners are purpose driven businesses and a lot of the technology is driven by purpose doing good for the world changing the world in some way and 
there's a lot of misconceptions, I believe, uh, around brand in the exactly what you just said before, which is um, branding is just uh, pretty pictures and uh, fluffy colors and fonts and things like that as well, which it's not. <laughs> it's so much more. I, I and there's so much you can do with brand. All the time. Mm. You get that all the time. Yeah. So, um, you know, people go, oh, you're into branding. So, you know, that's a logo, a set of colors and some fonts, isn't it? And you're like, uh. so um, to counter that, like you need to have a clear definition of, of a brand, right? And so my, my definition, the best I can kind of define brand as is the meaning that people attach to you and your, your offering, okay? Now, that's kind of a scary definition for business leaders to kind of get their heads around because what that says is they don't really own that that meaning, that brand, if, if, you get, if you get it, because that exists in the hearts and the minds of their audience. What, what they can do is, um, uh, which is the game that I'm in, is branding, which is the attempt to manage that meaning. It's the thoughtful, purposeful uh, look at all the signals a business gives off, the whole customer experience, the whole employee experience, the culture of the business, the leadership of the business, all of those things considered in a purpose-focused way so that um, the meaning can become managed and the decisions that are taken aren't just kind of ad hoc and, uh, and uh, um, knee-jerk. They are they're thought through from that kind of perspective, like why are we here, who do we exist to serve, and why should they care? And once you kind of have um, a very clear strategy and some tools at your disposal, that can become easier. And I can go into those in a minute. But just before I do, just one quick thing that you you mentioned, you know, um, about some of the audience that we're that, that, that are listening to this podcast is that one thing I find is that when businesses start off, like in, um, in any sector, um, and particularly in, in kind of the, the tech sector, because you've got a lot of kind of fast growing um, businesses which are which are you know tech focused and u- utilizing technology to really grow into maybe apps or whatever it might be the thing the thing is is the purpose is often lodged in the in the person's mind that founds the company or the group of people that found it and often that's that's a great obviously that's fine so when the business is small that's absolutely fine because they don't almost need to write it down um, and they don't really need to kind of articulate that vision because it's kind of inerrant it's it's why we're here we all know that why would we bother defining it. But obviously, what happens with businesses, as you, you'll know, is they grow. Um, they have this, you know, if they're successful, it's unfortunate, but they do scale. And then what happens is you get various tension points as the business grows. And the first kind of major tension point and challenge that a business faces usually is um, is this concept of control. Because eventually, you employ enough people or, par- or partner with enough other kind of businesses um, that don't really know the leadership team. Like some, I had a leader say to me the other day, the trouble is, Matt, like people are recruiting people and I don't even know who they are. I'm walking around these corridors. They're all working for me, but I don't even know their names. Um, and so that, that causes, it produces its own challenges because suddenly the, the purpose and the drive and the passion and the reason why we exist can, unless it's managed carefully, can become completely lost. And in 10, 15, 20 years' time, um, it's almost non-existent. And we're just here to make money, um, which is not uh, an exciting prospect for, for anyone and definitely not from the customer's perspective. The customer doesn't care how much money you want to earn. They want to know, you know, in the bigger thing, why, why you exist, your purpose. So as you, I would say, when you start, it is great, even though that purpose is kind of clear, it's obvious to everybody in that leadership team why you exist. Define it still because it gives you then something, a platform to hinge everything off of um, as you grow. And, and then, it make, then you can make sure that as you recruit, you know, the people you're recruiting understand that purpose and believe in what you believe and it makes life easier. And you don't then have to call someone like me in 20, 30 years down the line when everything's splintered and, uh, and all over the place. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, you need to put it kind of reassemble it back together because that is painful. Um, so yeah, so I'd say purpose. Keep purpose and vision at the heart of, of, of everything you're doing and don't lose sight of it. Like hang on to it forever because without that vision of, of, of the, the brand and why it exists, um, you won't be able to lead anyone anywhere, uh, customers, mm. staff, partners, whoever it might be. 
that's a really good point about like leadership. So leadership is not just about internal leadership and effective management and growth of the company. You do need to lead your partners, your staff, your customers, um, and everything needs to trickle back to that why. Because exactly what you said, you know, your customers don't really care how much money you're making. They only care how you're benefiting them, how reliable you're going to be in the long term and how you're helping them achieve their goals, solving their problems and everything else. Um, and there's a, you know, because there's a lot of our listeners that are kind of in the early stage startup phase um, of sort of tech businesses. But I also kind of consider, you know, like a lot of like you know, manufacturing, construction, IT, still part of, of tech. And, of you know, some of these businesses have been around for a very long time and either never really considered the importance of brand or branding and um, have moved that their business purpose may have moved on since when they started. So one of the questions that I have had and it's cropped up quite a few times is um, how do you measure the return on investment from going through a branding exercise? Uh, because it's, in my experience, it's very difficult to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is, this is, you know, if I'm completely transparent and honest, it is a challenge because everyone says, Matt, you know, what, what's my return on the investment? Okay. Now, often when you're, when you're um, looking at brands, you can measure the value of a brand. So for example, um, you can uh, put in front of a test focus group, for example, a product uh, non-branded of your competitors, you know, scrub their brand out, stick a label over it, whatever, and your own product and do the same. And then you can say, look, how much would you charge for these products? How much would you pay for them, et cetera? And you can find out um, the value of those without any branding on them. Then you can take the brand labels off, right? And do it with another test group or do it, even do it with the same test group later on. And so they understand who has manufactured, who has created these products. And then ask the same question. And you may find an interesting difference in, in cost value that the, the, the customer might place on that product because they know, for example, the brand behind uh, the the product and therefore they associate various things like you know value based stuff to that brand, um, and that then gives you an indicator like flipping neck our brand you know just just our brand alone can can increase uh, the perception from the customer by 10, 15, 20 percent of the value they place on that product. So you can do it, but that's obviously on a big scale, particularly commodity based brands uh, can do that. Although um, thinking, thinking about that from a commodity point of view, because I was watching the Grand Prix at the weekend <laughs> and uh, chatting to a few people that are in the machining space and the perception, uh, you know, like we've got Haas, um, the F F1 Haas team, and yep. the perception on Haas machinery is that A, it's more expensive and B, it's of a much superior quality to a lot of the other machines on the market because, well, obviously, because they have a Formula One team. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's all about perception. It's all about perception. It's actually all about story, which uh, we can kind of fall into in a minute. But I just did want to just touch on one kind of key, key point, which is when... Um, when you do anything which, um, which pushes a business into the next level, for example, you know, if you want to grow your business some, somewhere else, um, you need vision. You need leaders to say, look, we, we are here today, but we want to become this. We want to grow to this. We want to um, fulfill our, you know, solve our customers' needs so that they, they value us more. Now, to do that, you really kind of need to leap into the unknown a little bit. Now, not, I'm not saying ignore data. I'm not saying um, be foolish. What I'm saying is, is that you do need some form of faith, right, when you go through and look at brand. Because what you can do is you can easily see when a brand is not working. When a brand is not working, you see things like uh, disjointed staff uh, kind of pulling in different directions. You see leaders doing one thing over here, contradicting themselves over there. You see, um, you see customer experience fall down in specific areas consistently. And so you know that there's problems with this brand. It, you know, even without a huge amount of brand experience, you can see there's issues here. Um, and also, as the businesses grow, these issues become harder and harder to fix because nothing is joined up. And that's the bit that's missing. And so I think what business does is it says, right, marketing, you guys take brand and you, you're in charge of it. But then what I'm finding is, is like HR teams are like, well, hold on. With social media now, we need to take the look and feel of the business and put out ads to attract talent. Um, 
Can we talk to marketing about that? Marketing are not interested in that. Um, well, hang on, then HR go off and do their own thing. And then that sort of starts to undermine the brand as well. And then the leaders are like, what is this brand stuff? It's all fluffy. The whole thing becomes hugely disjointed. And, and that's why I'm a bit of a champion for what I call like the CBO, the, the chief branding officer, which, um, which really, you know, the CEO or the, the managing director um, ultimately could, could be. They're the ones that should be looking at every business decision and trying to join it up with, with a clear vision, with values, with behaviors, et cetera, that, that come from that. And so what I was going to what, what, you know, what I'm saying is, is that there is this uh, leadership piece that it always starts with the leaders and leaders have got to envisage that future that when the brand has done everything it needs to do, what the world will look like, the change we're trying to affect in the world. And that isn't something that you can get from data looking behind you. That's something that you have to create mentally first so that you can pull everybody towards that direction. And that takes faith. And it isn't a, and that's why it's kind of not an easy ROI. It should, it, you know, it's, you can track it and you can work with it along the way uh, to get you there, but it isn't always about the numbers. It's about creating something, a culture that will, that will ultimately allow you to then build into that, the profit share, et cetera, that you need. So it is a tough one, I'll be honest. And, and that's yes. why I guess branding gets the fluff name and we get the fluffy, you know, oh, that's a fluffy brand person. But I, I would say to you, underneath the fluff, if you don't have the fluff, if we call it that, then you're going to find, you know, all these other problems that you, that you struggle to solve, which are intrinsically linked to ROI. And so it's the magic source to help you get that return that you want. And that was always one of my biggest frustrations. Uh, I think it was my job as so I'd moved over from like head of sales and marketing, um, which is a great job. <laughs> I love that job because it brings everything together. Uh, to then just head of marketing, which is very much in isolation. And even though yes, I was part yeah. of the leadership team and you're, you're representing the marketing department, it still felt very much an isolated role, and that you were looking too much about the marketing and not about everything else that that worked on. Definitely. I, I call it smarketing, right? Smarketing. <laughs> yeah. marketing together. But also after you've sold something, you know, what's the onboarding experience like for customers? What's the, uh, wh how are you supporting them with your account management through their, through their experience of using you? Um, and how are you then offboarding them? I mean, that's a whole area that people completely neglect. Like we don't care when people want to leave us. Well, I think we should care because the future um, could potentially yield them coming back to you, you know? Yeah. And so, if you give, if you think about and design all of those different touch points, those different areas, map it out. Um, there's huge value to be gleaned. I can't tell you how much value that is until you do it, until we start looking at it, and still until we start monitoring it. But I'm telling you, it will be valuable for you for sure yeah. um, going forwards. It does, and that that was the key thing for me because you have to, you know, from from a marketing point of view, you've got salespeople, business development people giving you a hard time saying you're not giving me the marketing materials that I need. And as a, as a marketer, <laughs> you're like, I know this. However, you're not giving me the customer-based insights that I need in order to produce you the, the materials that you need. And what you do is you end up in this, this cycle, especially for, well, I say larger businesses. This, you know, we're, we're talking about like kind of 50 people plus. So we're not talking like huge, huge organizations here. But there's so much... Um, uh, it's very, very disjointed uh, because I think, you know, for me, the three kind of key areas, which is sales, marketing and customer service, all need to communicate. And marketing needs to have those conversations with the customers. They need to know what questions customers are asking. They need to know what questions prospects are asking because then you can, you know, feed everything in together. And, um, you know, exactly what you've said and the sort of theme of what we're talking about, which is, you know, really understand who are you talking to and meeting those uh, reasons why um, and and making sure that that purpose is inbuilt in there as well. Absolutely. So it's about alignment, isn't it? And, you know, I think that's the, the biggest challenge from a business perspective. You've got all these people, um, you know, we're trying to lead them somewhere. Where are we trying to lead them? How are we going to lead them there? Um, it's alignment and it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but you can do it um, with thought, with processes, with, with tools. Um, you mentioned a very interesting point there about customer insights across um, across sales, marketing, uh, et cetera. Um, one of the key things that I'm massively passionate about is, is something I call agile. Well, I, I don't call it. I think um, Marty Neumeyer, who's like a branding uh, expert from, uh, from Silicon Valley, coined in one of his books, 
Um, it's called Agile Strategy. And basically, I've been doing this for years and I didn't have a name for it. So I thank Marty for, uh, for, for, for coining the phrase. Basically, it's about um, getting the right people in the room to innovate, make decisions, review, and then running off uh, with action points and doing whatever sprints, et cetera, and then getting those people back in the room to review and continue to evolve and improve. And so I do a a lot of that stuff with leadership teams because it means you can get a lot of stuff done quick with decision makers. It doesn't have to be long protracted 18 month rebranding projects. You can get designers in a room, leaders in a room, strategists in a room and get stuff done over the course of a week, for example, which is amazing. You know, the, the results you can get is phenomenal. And then you can test that. You can either have customers in the room helping, you know, champion customers who love you. And you can give them that privilege to experience the next step in your, in your brand evolution. Or you can, you can do that yourselves and then bring that into focus groups um, the following week with customers to, to kind of assess what, what we're going, what's going on. And I think that is a massively underlooked aspect of innovation and, uh, and, and thinking from a design perspective, design thinking, I guess it is, because as designers, we're used to doing that. But in business, we're not ten, we don't tend to, uh, to think from, from you know, get, get other people in. We kind of go into our little dark room, do a load of stuff, try and launch it. And then, oh, sugar, it's not worked. Oh, you know, but if you do it with people, design with people, not for people, is the kind of, uh, is the kind of soundbite, I guess, uh, that, that I would put in there. Oh, yeah, I love it. It's all, all, all about doing stuff with people. It's, uh, I say this all the time about communications. Communicate with your audience, not at your audience. <laughs> you know, there's so many people that just want to sort of um, throw things at people and just expect them to digest it or get what you mean. Um, so, yeah, if you just involve them in the conversation in the first place, then you've much more, you know, you're much more likely to then engage with them. And it de-risks it a little bit, right? Because say you know you can do this on a large scale. Say you've got a new a new product that you want to um, you know you want to launch, or even better, you start before that. You 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 start thinking you know about my innovation pipeline. What's coming up? What should we do? You get customers in the room and you listen to them. You understand what goals and challenges their unmet needs might be, and you open up those you know those potential problems that they've got, and then you narrow in down on the best. So the best, kind of the biggest problem they've got, that, and the solution uh, that that you could you could then bring to bear on it. Then you open back up around that solution and that that key problem. What other solutions could we could we could we uh, think about for this? And then narrow down on the best one from that perspective in order to deliver it. And so what you've got there is what we kind of call the the double diamond uh, technique from a design thinking perspective, and it allows you to really create and start to think about creating with customers stuff that they that you know that they will will resonate with them in their marketplace because they you've done it with them right so that's why i say um, agile teams mixed disciplines in the room quick we can't be doing business uh, and and innovating over the course of you know 5 years anymore we've got that 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 timeline is coming right down to literally let's get people in the room and get stuff out in the next 3 months um, and uh, it's, innovation cycles are, are, you know, shortening and shortening. But businesses, they're not sort of ready for it. So we need to kind of, that's why Agile Strategy is a great tool. I've got tons of stuff, a uh, little shameless plug on my website about it. So, you know, have a, have a look there. Um, but you can, you can start implementing it. And it doesn't cost the world. What it does need is a mindset, a drive, and an energy. And that's, where, that's, what, a brand, that's what brand thinking can give you. That's what having a clear vision can, can give you. So there we go. Yeah, and I think that that was one of the things that came out when I, I heard you talk about this, which was um, it was addressing a common misconception in the industry because especially the world that I came from, you know, I came from a very traditional, you know, sort of like mining, surveying, like shipping world where every time you started talking to anybody about brand, the perception was that you needed, you know, years to, um, you know, address the brand. You needed like, you know, like a a considerable amount of money to even make any changes or do anything. And what was really nice about- And then you were just hearing with a new logo at the end of it. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I've spent millions on a new logo and all we've change Mm -hmm. like, like one little thing. Yeah. Okay. And that's not branding. No, no way. And sometimes, you know, some clients come to me and they say, we need, um, we need, uh, you know, a new brand. And you're talking to them, they think it's a logo and some fonts. And then by the time you finish, actually, we don't need to change the logo uh, at all. 
And the logo is fine. It's distinctive enough. It's a label ultimately to point customers to meaning. And where you need to spend your time and effort and energy with your leadership team is on, well, what is the meaning that we want people to attach to us? Um, and that's where, if we could segue into storytelling, um, that, that's where that, I would suggest, comes in. Because if brand is the meaning people attach to us, branding is the management of that meaning, then the question is, is, well, how best, what's the simplest and quickest way that we can create meaning in the hearts and minds of our audience? And as human beings, the, the simplest way that we create um, meaning is through this idea of stories, which again, everyone goes, oh, that sounds a bit fluffy. But let me just, um, let me just give you, uh, I guess, a, you know, a little example. Like if you think about um, a can of baked beans, right? Um, <laughs> let's boil it down to a can of baked beans. Um, this is where it could get really weird. Um, let's just say you've got a Tesco's own can of baked beans. Uh, you know, um, other brands are available as well, but just for the sake of argument, Tesco. Let's say, I don't know, how much is Tesco baked beans? Maybe 40p or something for a can of Tesco baked beans. Um, uh, and then you compare that with, say, a baked bean brand like Heinz, which is probably charging around a pound for um, some baked beans. There's like 60% difference in the two. Now, the baked beans, you know, they might be a little bit better, but 60% better, you know, is that a thing? The value that, that's placed on that? No. What are people paying for? They're not paying ultimately for the, the, the features of the, of, the, of the baked beans because they're both baked beans. One may be ever so slightly better quality or that, that, that might be challenged. Um, what are they actually buying? They're buying the narrative, the story, the brand that Heinz has been issuing out, that they are the best. Um, they do the advertising. They've been there first, um, and uh, and they're trusted to deliver on on what they promise. Whereas, say Tesco generic baked beans doesn't have that intrinsic narrative to it, and so less value is placed on it. Now, you take that concept and put it into a manufacturing context. Um, you are there with your competitor. You're both selling exactly the same thing. Now, you go into a price war, and it's a race to the bottom until one business goes bust, and then you, know, then you start again. That is no fun for anybody, right? So I always say to people, let's, not, let's stop worrying about what the competition's doing per se. Let's look at the intrinsic meaning that people are going to start to attach to us. Let's look at trying to be more distinctive, more unique, and telling a story which nobody else can tell. And so that then can give you more value. Um, and it can, you've got to manage that very carefully and you've got to live it and you've got to be super authentic to it. But what it then does is allows you to differentiate and charge, um, and charge more in the B2B space. It makes it more exciting. Your marketing has more energy to it. Um, and your, um, your, your, your staff can get behind it. So after you've got your vision, story is definitely something to start thinking about, but not, not even like your story. The way I see it is you've got to become a character in your customer's story. And this is where story can become a really amazing tool because if you understand the type of personality collectively, all of your team and the products that you're producing becomes in your customer's story, it, it, it becomes about your customer. And you know, you zoom out and you go, right, well, who is our customer? It's a buyer or it's a, a warehouse manager or whoever it might be. What are they trying to become? Well, they're trying to you know, uh, grow this, they're trying to get a promotion, whatever it might be. So, and they're looking for a solution to this very specific problem right now. But what else are they looking for in their lives? Um, what else do they believe? Where are they placed in the country? Where, where, you know, what belief system, what is their psychographic, we call it? What are they actually trying to achieve? Do they believe in green energy? Do they believe in, in these other things? And once you kind of spend more time with customers asking those types of questions and you zoom out from just the specific tiny little thing that your product does, you can then design your whole customer experience around that customer. You can become that, 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 that character in their story that becomes the mentor, the advisor, the ally to take them to the next stage. Um, one of the tools I use is, um, which I've probably talked to you about, is... Um, is 12 kind of key archetypes which turn up in stories. And I love to do this with leadership teams. So you sit everybody down, you split them maybe into two or three groups, and you present these 12 archetypes. Archetypes are typical 
patterns of behavior, typical characters um, that are amplified in stories. And what you say is, is, look, you know, here are the 12, there's like a rebel, a ruler, a sage, a jester. There's all these different types of character, which instinctively we respond to because of our deep connection with, with, um, with stories. And I say to them, right, let's just uh, spend some time to figure out which, which one you think you are. And then I call the group back around again and we say, all right, what's happened? And, and more often than not, in fact, I think about 100% of the time, to be honest, uh, each team will say there's something different. And these archetypes are actually linked to customer motivations. There's a lot of deep psychology in them. But what that, that, that sort of exercise does is it, it shows and exposes that we need, we've got a problem here because one group thinks we're about the ruler, which is about exuding control over chaos. Another group thinks we're the sage, which is all about wisdom and knowledge, and people come to us for that data, for truth. Another group thinks we're an explorer and we're taking the customer on a journey to this amazing destination. Now, you can't, you're schizophrenic if you're like that. Like, if one leader over there thinks they're that, they're going to run off and, and be, um, be articulating that to their teams and they're going to take that out to the customer. Um, and that's, you know, and if you've got five or six different versions of truth, that's a problem. So if you can boil it down to say one archetype, like we know that we are the, uh, you know, the sage. We know that that's why we exist. It links in with our vision and our purpose and our values. And we're going to champion knowledge and data and wisdom. We are the Yoda of the manufacturing industry, right? Come to us for knowledge uh, and the force will be strong with us. Um, then you've got a kind of a, a very simple lens to look at every business decision that you make. And so archetypal branding and archetypes and storytelling become, suddenly becomes a very powerful tool, yes, for marketing and creative teams to produce um, that veneer at the end, which will reflect that sage-like quality that you want to, to exude into the marketplace. But not just that, internally with your teams, you can, you know, you can build cultures around rituals, which celebrate data and wisdom, for example. And in your leadership team, you, know, you, can, you can then use that as a lens to look at, well, we're sourcing our, our materials from this place. Um, have we done any data analysis on this? Can we justify this from a, a sage-like perspective as to why this company is being used to source that, those nuts and bolts, et cetera? So archetypal branding, storytelling, I found very powerful to use with leadership teams. Um, and I've come at that from a marketing perspective, but when you apply it in a business perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's super powerful. Oh, 100%. There's a few things that you touched on in that, because uh, I'm a huge advocate for storytelling. One of my previous um, podcast episodes with Russell Stalters, we were talking all around um, story brand. And I'm sure if you read Donald Miller, Building a Story Brand. Yeah, a little um, bit, yeah. Yeah, so it's like kind of positioning your customer as the hero in your story, but then obviously yeah. you've got all those characters that help the hero achieve the goals and, and everything else. Um, but especially like you're talking about archetypes, I talk a lot about uh, values-driven branding as well, um, which you did talk about because we as human beings, we generally prefer to do business with people and companies that meet our values. Mm. And this was like really clear to me because I had literally no idea what I was doing. Um, when I worked for a company that, because I had no prior marketing experience really to that. I was just kind of making it up as I went along. But one of the things that kind of came clear was the fact that we had within this small company individual characters and we all had our own kind of like what I called accidental personal brands because people in the industry knew of individuals that worked for the company. So mm -hmm. there was that trust for um, delivery. There was that trust for exceptional customer service. There was that trust that you would get a really fast response. There was that trust that you would get an honest response you know you wouldn't be sold something that you didn't need just because the sales team were trying to hit deadlines and kpis and things like that and it's all of those uh, values that kind of like come through um <coughs> excuse me all those values that come through and um the customers buy into that and what we ended up with this particular company it was a small company but the brand value for that company was so much greater than you know so or rather they they could compete against you know some of the really really big players in the market because they had this brand value but it wasn't right. just off the back of the company it's also off the back of the personal brands of the staff that worked in that yeah definitely i mean personal brands are very interesting uh thing because i think as the world gets more connected and communicate like linkedin for example you can find out 
most of uh, you know every everybody that works in a business can be can be uncovered by you know by by research very simple research on linkedin right so personal branding is super important if you've got a team which are not really that skilled um, and you're trying to veneer that as being really skilled, you're, get, you're going to get found out. Um, whereas if you've got thought leaders in your organization who have their personal brands, which all contribute to the same value system and, and, and vision, then you're, you're more likely to succeed. In fact, I think there's a new, well, kind of a new strand of branding, which is, uh, which is really kind of coming to the fore, which is CEO branding. Because if you think about a lot of the biggest businesses on the planet, you know, you think of Tesla and Elon Musk, and you think of you know, Apple with Steve Jobs, and you think of Microsoft, and you know, with with you know, even going back in time, the leadership, the the, the figurehead of those organisations, often embodied what that organisation was about, and so, you know, leadership teams, I think, are going to have to start thinking more and more about the meaning that each of them uh, individually want to uh, want to manage, and 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 that that kind of archetype that they want to put out into the world so that so that people respond effectively to them as individuals as well as having an idea of their collective uh, meaning um, so that when they go in together that that has a, a kind of a core purpose and a core strategy behind it so that's another kind of can of worms to open up uh, <laughs> at some other time personal branding but a lot of the principles we're talking about here apply you know, you need to, I, I always like, I do a bit of kind of coaching and mentoring for CEOs and stuff myself. And, you know, when you run through the archetype uh, exercise with them, it's super interesting as to wh which archetype they think they are. And that helps give them a framework and a purpose for activities they might do extracurricular or even within the organization to help reinforce that, that meaning that, that, that they're building their profile on. So, yeah, so it, it applies. And it really helps you recruit on the whole archetypes, CEO archetypes, leadership team archetypes. Um, from my experience um, over the last sort of like eight years at least, um, it's that you, yeah, it really, really helps you recruit because you make all these mistakes in your earlier career on recruitment when you don't necessarily know these things. Because um, yeah. I think sometimes, I think, well, I don't know, speaking for myself here, you try to recruit people that are like you, that share similar behaviors, that share similar <coughs> um, values. But then you realize and you have a look at your team and you just think, right, okay, cool. Well, I'm not actually looking for the same version of myself in my team. I'm actually looking for somebody that really complements me very, very well. Somebody that's slightly different that you can bounce off. Um, you know, because I'm the kind of more kind of maverick creator type of um, archetype. And I need somebody to work with that's very process driven and very structured to kind mm. of like rein me back in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it does. It really helps you, um, helps you recruit. And I think there's a lot of, exactly what we've said in this um conversation that branding isn't just marketing because a lot of people think branding falls into marketing but it just has adds so much value to the organization as it, a whole it's, it's been given to, to the marketing department um traditionally i think probably because of um you know when a new product is launched everybody perceives the brand as the logo and the font so people think well marketing are in charge of positioning that let's give it to, to marketing but the truth is as, as we've as we've clearly sort of articulated, brand touches everything. You can't just leave it as a veneer at the end. You've got to purposefully think about brand through all the aspects of your organization. And otherwise, you're going to get found out. You know, in today's connected world, customers have more power than they ever, ever, ever had. And if, um, if you know, take for example, you know, a few years ago, Starbucks, um, it was uh, um, suggested that they didn't pay as much tax as they should have been paying, you know, their kind of uh, positioning from a marketing perspective from their brand proposition was, you know, enriching human lives every one cup at a time or something like this. And um, then the press discovered that their finance department had perhaps been behaving in, I think they were legal, but it was not, um, you know, it was not deemed by the press as a particularly ethical way. Um, and suddenly then there was a massive boycott of Starbucks, which meant that they lost a lot of money uh, a few years back. So when you think about that, hang on a second, why was no brand thinking being applied to the finance department? Now, marketing uh, traditionally can't go over to finance and say, guys, um, we think you should uh, not um, you know, be doing tax in this way because <laughs> businesses are not set up like this. So we have a problem. So businesses have to start evolving, in my view. Um, they have to start thinking about brand from the very, very top. And that needs to filter right the way through. Um, and so, you know, through, through, as we said, through everything, through HR, through 
finance through um, through to your marketing and sales and operations. That that brand thinker, thank, brand kind of frameworks, values, beliefs, etc., have to be there, and people have to be held accountable for them. Otherwise, the business may find itself in a position where it's irrelevant and it's suffering uh, because of behaviours which don't fit with what customers believe should be there. And you can grow a lot faster. If you can nail this right from the word go, you can grow a lot faster. Okay. It's a lot more effortless, um, if that's even a proper way of structuring sentence. Um, mm-hmm. And um, it, yeah, it just makes your life so much easier. So there's a few specific questions that I do want to ask based on that. Like if you are a startup company or you're a well-established company that's never really thought about brand, uh, so you were sort of starting from scratch, where would you start and how would you focus your effort and resources? Sure. So if you're just starting out and uh, in business per se, I would say you start with uh, articulating that vision. You start with that. It's so basic, um, but it's so important. You create a vision statement, something that's snappy, that encapsulates um, the change you wish to make in the world, right? You've got to think, if you're thinking big, think bigger, right? Think the world, think humanity, think mankind, you know? What is it that, that you're trying to achieve for the, for the world? Um, so if you're in a manufacturing, I don't know, um, I'm just going to pluck something out of the air. Imagine it was, um, your vision would be to, to ensure that across manufacturing there was no downtime or something, you know, I don't know. Zero downtime is the world we imagine is um, um, plants with zero downtime, right? Great. That's something big. That's something huge. And then you've got to build into that, you know, the the rest of your stuff. So then I say, the next thing to think about is your mission. You know, how are you going to start achieving your big hairy goal? You know, to make to make to ensure there's no downtime in manufacturing um, X, Y, and Z. How are we going to do that? Um, and then you 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 go down even further. So um, you then look at your values, and then you you look at your. So we we will do this through these guardrails. We'll never lie. We'll not you know we will not um, cheat. We will not, whatever it might be. Um, we value innovation. We value uh, which is a classic one. But but then you've got to think about okay, what do we mean by that? If we value innovation, what does that mean? What behaviors should come out of that? And that may apply differently to different parts of your organization. So I often say have a clear, simple value, but then within the teams of your organizations, let the managers decide how that the behaviors of their team should slot into that that value system. And then underneath that, um, you know, create this story, this narrative, and ensure everybody knows about it. So there's, there's this key leadership piece, and then it's cascading that out through your organization. So once you've done that, and everyone understands what they should be, you then have to analyze whether that's the case. So plot out and map out your customer journey and analyze it, go through it with customers, go through it with teams, figure out whether or not you are living into that narrative, that story of that archetype, figure out uh, pain points and areas you can improve. So do that with your customers, do that with your employee experience. You know, when someone joins us, are we, how are we onboarding them? What's their experience? How are we developing them? When they leave us, how are we um, ensuring that we send them on their way in the best possible way? So you do that with those two. You do it with your product innovation as well. You know, what's in the pipeline? How are we innovating? How can we ensure that we are going to produce products in the future which help to live up to our, our big hairy vision? And then the final thing, in my view, is to then focus um, on the brand identity, the look and feel, the tone of voice after you have had a bit of a, a grapple in those three or four areas, because um, a lot of people just jump to the end and they go uh, headlong into the veneer, the, the look and feel, the graphic design, which is where you know my background came from. And it used to so upset me because you know I'd start asking questions like, well, 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 who's our customer? Have you got any customer personas that we could look at so that we can ensure that we're designing something that will appeal to them? Um, and a lot of businesses don't have those basics in place. So get the basics right, figure out why you exist, who you exist to serve, why they should care, um, create that compelling uh, story that you can, your leadership team can all get behind, and then uh, look at ways of actually you, to start to live that through your operations, et cetera, and then go to your creative team, your marketing, your marketing team, and say, look, now we understand. This is how we're going to position ourselves. But every single step of that journey, you need to involve customers. You need to think about it from 
the customer's perspective because it's that meaning that's in their hearts and minds that you want to influence, not just we want this and, uh, and, and, and out you go. So mm. that's it really. I think, I think um, customer-centric innovation, customer-centric thinking has got to be the future. Otherwise, um, you know, you won't get very far very fast. And I think it's the amount of companies that I talk to and see that have never gone through that exercise of actually mapping out their entire customer journey. Um, and I know as well, like, I look back at the company, um, one of the companies that I've worked for in the past, and we did it way too late. You know, we we did end, we ended up working with a consultant and we got the consultant in that just took us through, like, you know, actually, let's have a look at each stage of the customer journey. Where can we improve it? Where are we missing a trick? Um, where are the opportunities? Where are the challenges? And um, that was really eye opening for me quite a few years ago. And I was just like, wow, there's so much value that you can gain from this um, in sure. all well, aspects of business. It's about empathy with the customer. You know, some businesses, really big businesses, and I definitely think this is even worth doing even if you're a small business, is to put some of your team in the shoes of your customer, right? So I think it was Whirlpool, right? It's part of their training. I under, If I remember reading this correctly, they have like a house all set up with their Whirlpool uh, products. And they send teams to this house and they get, they, they get to live there for a couple of days, but they can only use Whirlpool products. And so you know, they suddenly get to, to experience things from the customer's point of view. That brings huge empathy. And then when you're mapping out your customer journey, you start to, one of the things you can do is look at it from an emotional perspective. Like, how's the customer feeling at stage one? You know, if you're a breakdown company or you're, you're servicing, you know, maintenance, the first point of call with the customer, the customer's probably going to be feeling really anxious, quite stressed, possibly angry. Um, and so just understanding that means that you can design your training around that particular feeling like you know we need to make sure that we're sharp and sharp we're offering options to the customer we are we are on the ball um, we're not putting them through 50 hours of uh, of phone uh, <laughs> yeah. delays that we're really quick um, and but then once we've articulated you know once we've sorted that the customer will feel relief so at that point, what do we do? How do we reinforce the relief and, and keep them updated as to when our engineer will come around to fix their problem? You know, maybe there's email triggers that we could we could set off to just keep everybody's mind in that kind of relieved state that we know. I don't know. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that mapping it out, having a basic map to start with and then detailing it and going really deep with it, as you say, can really offer up opportunities to enforce the brand voice, the brand, the, being that character, the right person at the right time in, in that customer's uh, story. Yeah, and nothing can make or break a, co a company's reputation or brand than a really bad experience at time of need. Yeah, and it's a shame that sometimes that, that is, that, it's at that point that companies then decide, right, okay, uh, we've lost a company or we've um, had a bit of a PR issue um because of a really bad experience which could have been avoided by actually looking at that whole customer journey because it's back onto that you know um people will always remember how you make them feel and you know working in companies where customer service has been huge because i've always dealt in sort of like safety and, and sort of technical information that puts staff at risk or rather that helps prevent staff being at risk you know you need to be able to respond um, in a way that puts them puts their mind at ease, that they know that they can get an immediate response. Um, and if you're not there achieving that, then that can have a significant impact on uh, the brand reputation, the company reputation, customer retention, everything else. I mean, one of the biggest things that I think is worth pointing out when it comes to brand is, is that um, the experience of what brands do for us is the ultimate um, kind of feeling, emotion, meaning that I'm going to attach to that that business, particularly in B2B. Um, and that is kind of often overlooked in branding. Um, but if you want people to, to love you, come back to you, tell other people about you, you need to make sure you're designing stuff around them. So to make things better, you've got to, to make better things, if that kind mm -hmm. of makes sense. So it's no longer just like you're going to turn up with a parcel and dump the product on the customer's uh, desk, you know, You've got to design that experience so that it's a, a an unboxing experience that, um, <laughs> that, that 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 they love. You know, it's almost, <clears throat> but obviously suitably within the archetype, within the expectations of that customer, um, whatever it might be. And uh, you know, it might even be like, say, you're installing, I don't know, conveyor belts uh, or something like this for for your manufacturing clients or something. Um, maybe it's about. Um, 
you know, as I say, having some sort of experience so that once it's installed, it's not just like, there you go, Larry, off, you know, good luck with it. It's kind of like, a, a, you know, you put a little ribbon around it and it's a, a you know, it's an experience and, you, you know, you get the, the CEO to snip the ribbon and there's a photo and it goes on Instagram. And, you know, it's kind of a more of a moment rather than a, than a kind of a just a, yeah, see you later, I'm off to do my next gig. It's a careful, thought through thing. So applying design thinking uh, purposefully and thoughtfully layered on top of your bra- overall brand thinking is definitely the future to, to, to grow your business. In my, it would be my suggestion. Got to humanize everything that you do. <laughs> for me, it's all yeah. about the human element. But sure, brilliant. Well, I realize that we've been talking for quite a while now. Uh, there's a couple of questions um, a few people asked me um, that I didn't have the answer to. So I thought, you know, it is a little bit, you know, I think, again, it's part of that old perception that branding is all to do with the, the logos and the fluffy stuff. But sure. um what would your advice be to somebody who's asking around uh, brand protection? So how would you protect a brand or do you need to trademark a brand? Sure. So, I mean, it's interesting if you, I think if you've created something that's very different, that, that, you know, it shouldn't be able to be copied. So I would sort of say the first point is I think there's something wrong in essence with that question. Um, but if you're worried about say China ripping you off and somebody, you know, over, over in the far East taking this idea and, and re-engineering it, um, obviously you've got the patent laws, right? Which are clear around that around the brand side of things in terms of brand identity, there's trademarking that you can, uh, that you can bring to bear on things. Um, I'm not a trademark lawyer. Um, I've had businesses trademark brands that I've, you know, brand identities that I've designed and produced. Um, but I often find that, um, that for, particularly for small businesses, it's not actually hugely that necessary. You know, it's, um, it, it's hard actually to be that unique anymore anyways, if we're being frank. So you can't copy uh, culture, I don't think. I think it's really, really difficult to work. And, and logos think. for me are just labels to meaning. Um, people can't copy. Co- so, so, you know, I would say uh, if you get to a certain size, get it trademarked, but I wouldn't worry too heavily about it and I wouldn't get too, uh, too upset about it. I think the focus should be more on innovating for the future, stuff that your customers won't, will never go anywhere else because they know that you are awesome and, and they believe in everything that you're doing. And if you've got your culture right and you've got your vision right and you've been building everything effectively from the start, then the trademarking side of things becomes less of an issue. So you're seeing a lot more brands now launching, even massive companies launching without trademarking uh, their identities. Because if someone copies it, it's, it doesn't matter because they've been there first. They're, they're swimming in that ocean before, before anyone else. They're known for that. Um, and really, I think that's kind of, I guess, my message would be that in the innovation space, you know, you've got to look for ways of being truly distinctively different, not just in the logo that you produce, but in the offer and the meaning that you're, that you're looking at. So I'll give you one quick um, example of, of how you might do that just quickly. I run a, a workshop, an innovation workshop, and one of the exercises in it is you, is you get um, teams to list out the typical... Um, uh, kind of features of what you're offering, what what people would typically expect. So I don't know, say it's in retail. Oh, obviously, I know that's not your, your audience, but I'll just give you this example because we'd all understand it. Say it's in retail. You'd say, okay, we're a gift shop. Let's um, list out all our, all our typical expectations from a customer's perspective about what a gift shop looks like, feels like when I walk in. And so you'd say, right, it's got shelves, it's got stacked full of stuff, it's busy, whatever it might be. Great, so we'd have a massive long list of them. Then um, flip that, you know? So I think this is a, a Marty Neumeyer thing as well. I keep mentioning Marty Neumeyer. I'll have to put a link to some of his stuff. We will put a link in the show notes for sure. <laughs> one of his uh, exercises. Then you flip it. So let's take a look at, I don't know, it all has shelves. You ask the question, do you know what? What, what would happen if I walked into the, this gift shop and there were no shelves, right? What does that, what does that feel like? What, what then could we bring to bear? Maybe the uh, the staff bring out each gift. Maybe we have a conversation first and it's more of a kind of a, a more bespoke uh, uh, service. Suddenly you're innovating. You're thinking about things completely differently because you've, you've looked at what's typical and what's expected and then you're innovating around it. Now, some of the things that you would have listed out that's absolutely typical, you can't change because they're a key part of what the offer is all about. But there might be things 
that you can look at completely differently, which creates a completely new experience and a new space and a new product, which you can then go on and sell that no one else is doing. And it is that side of things that I would say, you've got to get out there, get it done. Sure, trademark the logo, but you've got to create something awesome first before you, you worry too much about being copied would be my suggestion. And you've got to be curious. For, for me, it's all about curiosity and uh, kind of why I started this podcast anyway. Um, and and ask those really podcast. important what if <laughs> questions. Yeah. No, absolutely. You've got to be curious. You've got to keep asking questions. No one knows everything. We're all still learning. We're all humans. Technology uh, is moving us faster than ever before. We're connected. We're traveling faster. You know, humanity is hurtling forward into the future. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got to ask those questions. What does that future look like? And, and is it good? Um, and can we make it better is the yes. key, key questions. Brilliant. What a way to finish this podcast. So I know you do have a fantastic book. Well, I say it's fantastic. I hear great things. It's on my reading list. <laughs> um, uh-huh. But I figured it'd be great to uh, share with our listeners uh, a little bit of info about your book, how to access it, and also how to keep in contact with you. Sure. So um, my book is called Storyatogy, and it's uh, it kind of runs through some of the things that we've been talking about today. It's um, it goes through a six step process, which you can do yourselves with a leadership team in your organization to really think about that core piece of the brand, why it exists, who exists to serve and the story that you can uh, start looking uh, at uh, all your businesses, businesses activities through. So super helpful if you're into, if you've liked what you've heard in the, in the podcast. Um, I've got loads of information and insight um, on, my, on my website, which is mrmattdavies.co.uk. Um, and that's M-R, not Mr. as in M-I-S-T-E-R. So that's <laughs> mrmattdavies.co.uk. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to say is... Um, that I have got a free ebook um, on there, which you might want to download. So it's kind of three essential tools to help align your people around brand thinking. Um, so yeah, so so definitely check out the the, the website, Mr. Matt Davies. Um, dot me actually, I think it is not dot co uk. Forgive me, I just ran that off. There. If you give me the links, I'll include them all I on my show notes. Let's on include the, uh, that. Website. You can tell I'm not, you know, I'm not set up to really market myself. I just. Walk <laughs> And, uh, and hope someone likes it, but then, you know, anyway, so yes. Yeah, so, um, check out my website, download the ebook. That's completely free. Um, and, and my book story Atogy, is on Amazon. So you can search for that or you can find a link to it through my website. I Great. need to work on that pitch, don't I, Charlie? That was just like, that was the most garbled <laughs> pitch I've ever done. But there we are. We're, we're, we're not all perfect. We'll have to work on that later. Well, the beauty of it is it's at the end of the podcast. People rarely listen to the end of a podcast before they've listened to the main body. So Good. hopefully people will realize the value that they will gain from your ebook, <laughs> from, your, uh, from your book. Forgive me, people. Forgive anyway. me. Thank you very much. No, thank you for having me. So yes, all the show notes will be available on my website, which is charliewyman.com forward slash podcast. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Matt, for joining me today. And I hope you've enjoyed this interview as much as I have. I I really have. And thanks so much for having me. And as I say, um, keep up the great work that you're doing. um, And I hope to uh, keep in touch over the coming coming months. Brilliant. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.